So we're already on the sixth Home Assistant release of the year, and this month there is a mixture of things to talk about. This month, the Voice Assistant has become more useful, allowing the Home Assistant and OpenAI Assistants to work together to answer your questions and control your smart home. There is a useful dashboard improvement, some meta changes, blueprint updates, and a nice little automation addition. We also shouldn't forget about the Home Assistant companion app for our phones and our tablets, which also receive various useful updates. I'll leave a link in the description to the blog for the latest release, which includes a particularly neat feature for the iPhone 15 Pro users, allowing you to activate the Home Assistant Voice Assistant with the action button on the side of your phone. So let's take a look at some of these in a bit more detail. As always, these updates are based on the beta release and therefore might change before the final release. Last month was actually a good example of this, whereby the team had to make the very rare decision to cut a large piece of functionality from the release due to a few issues which would have been difficult to fix in time for the release. So the first thing we have to talk about is being able to use LLMs as your conversation agent whilst being able to use the Home Assistant agent as well. If this doesn't make any sense, don't worry, it will in a minute. Home Assistant allows you to create multiple assist pipelines so that you can, for example, have one which uses Whisper to convert your speech into text, and then the Home Assistant conversation agent to process your command to turn on a light, for example. You can then have a separate pipeline which instead uses ChatGPT as the conversation agent. The problem with this is, is that then if you ask ChatGPT something, then it can answer general questions questions, but it can't control your home. And if you use the Home Assistant agent, then it can control your home, but it can't answer general questions. As of this release, you can now do both. In my limited testing, it's not perfect, but it's definitely usable, and I'm sure it'll get better in future releases. If using ChatGPT, then you'll need to have the OpenAI conversation integration set up, and then configure that as your conversation agent. Then if you click the cog, this is where you can change your prompt and enable or disable the ability to control Home Assistant. How tall is the OXO tower and turn on the left light? The OXO Tower is approximately 174 feet, 53 meters, tall. The left light has been turned on. This is a big step towards being able to compete with Google Home and Amazon because, to be honest, you've been able to do this from day one with those devices. Drop a comment below with your thoughts on this functionality. Before I talk about the next piece of functionality, I just wanted to say that I'm pleased to announce that I've now turned on the YouTube membership functionality for my channel. And if you become a member, it will really make the difference between me being able to continue doing what I enjoy creating these videos versus doing a day job. You see here that it says no subscription to Home Assistant Cloud, and I guarantee that for the first couple of memberships, they will go straight to me signing up to Nabucasa so that I can create these videos more easily and use Nabucasa on my beta Home Assistant instance. Okay, so on to the next feature. This is another assist related feature. You can now control your media devices without having to say the area the device is in. Room specific commands is something I use all of the time with Google, and I think media control will be a common one for most people. So now you can pause, resume, skip, or set a specific volume percentage really easily. For example, you just say the word next and it will skip to the next track in that room. I imagine this is just a start for this kind of functionality and I look forward to seeing what they bring next. The next set of improvements is a continuation from the last couple of releases which allow you to filter and group your entities and automations. There are now two new options so that you can collapse or expand all of your groups in one go. It now also remembers your filter selection so that if you go back and forth to specific tables then you won't lose the filters that you've set. It even does this at web browser tab level. You can see here that on one tab I'm filtering by the label of important and the other tab it's filtered by the category of useful. If I go to the scenes table and then back again you'll see that it's remembered the selections. It doesn't seem to remember the state of whether the filter selection is collapsed or expanded though, and it doesn't remember any search criteria, which I think would be a nice addition for a future release perhaps. And finally, when looking at your entities that are exposed to your voice assistants, you can now group them by either domain or area to find them more easily. 
The next couple of things I'm going to talk about are related to dashboards. For the past couple of years, I've been showing cards on my dashboard based on states of other entities using the fantastic custom card by Thomas Loven called Auto Entities. This allows me to show entities on my dashboard that are relevant to the room that I'm in at the time. However, last year, I think it was, they introduced native functionality to conditionally show cards based on various things such as entity state, screen size, and the logged in user. They've now extended this new sections dashboard so that as well as conditional cards, you can now have conditional sections as well. You could then have a section at the top with buttons perhaps, which you could use to show and hide other sections below it. I think that the combination of all the dashboard functionality that is now available really allows you to make fast and accessible dashboards that no other smart platform really even gets close to. And to round things off on the dashboard bits, you can now easily add a background image to your dashboard, and it can be different for each view as well. You can either type in a file path or directly upload an image from your PC. In the last release, a security feature was added to make login tokens expire automatically after 90 days, which would mean that you'd have to sign in again. You can now choose to prevent specific tokens from expiring by going to your profile, selecting the security tab, and then clicking the three dots next to the token that you wish to keep active. I guess this might be useful for guests which visit infrequently, or if maybe you have a holiday home running home assistant and you only visit it a couple of times a year. Now I have to confess, I don't really use blueprints. If there was some sort of built-in search functionality within Home Assistant for validated blueprints, then I'd probably use them more. But either way, they are a great feature, and now blueprint developers can add sections to the blueprints that are collapsible, which I think is a nice way of putting similar functionality together and keeping things nice and tidy, particularly for large automations. The next change is for NFC tags, which has been in Home Assistant for many years now. This release makes each tag an actual entity in Home Assistant, rather than just being a list of tags. It doesn't really change the way you use them in automations, because there's always been a specific tag trigger, but having it as an entity just makes sense, and it exposes an attribute called last scanned by device ID, which you can use in your automations. You can also add the entity to your dashboard if you want to. The next one is a new building block for automation actions called run in sequence. By default, the actions do run in sequence, and if you wanted to run actions in parallel, then you could use the run in parallel building block. However, if you want to run multiple things in parallel, with each of those having multiple actions, it got quite tricky. I imagine the most common use for the run in sequence block will be to nest it within a run in parallel block. For example, I have an automation here which sets the alarm, waits 10 seconds, and then turns on the vacation mode lights, whilst at the same time turning off all of the lights on the upstairs floor. And the final one to mention before we talk about noteworthy and backwards incompatible changes is updates to the Matter platform. Not too long ago, the Matter standard 1.3 was finalized and Home Assistant has already implemented it. I don't expect we will see Matter 1.3 devices for a while, but it's good to see that things are still moving forward and support for new device types keeps being added. They have made some other Matter improvements that I don't really understand and some always welcome bug fixes. So for other changes, you can now set a default code for an alarm panel, unless you've created yours in YAML, I believe. We have a new add template filter and this automation improvement, which I've just shown you. The next one is not under the new integration section, so I'm guessing the integration hasn't been working for some reason. I think that LoRa is going to become much more popular over the next few years, as there's more ready-to-use devices that are easier to buy and integrate without having to mess around with an Arduino IDE. So it's nice to see that we've got a working integration for the Things network. The Rio Link integration now has PIR and battery sensor entities for battery powered cameras, and the Tesla integration called Teslemetry apparently has some new features. There are also some existing integrations which have been upgraded to a quality grade of platinum. I've no idea about the effort involved to get an integration to the status of Platinum, but it's good for us because it means the integration is more likely to handle errors gracefully and not cause slowdowns in other areas of your system. For new integrations, we've got another new air quality integration and a new solar inverter integration. If you use the Monzo card, then you can now see your bank balance from within Home Assistant. 
As usual, there are a few integrations which have moved to set up via the UI. The file integration might be worth checking out as it allows you to read the last line of a text file and add it to Home Assistant as a sensor entity. As always, make sure you have a read through the break and changes section when upgrading your system so that you don't get any surprises. If you use MQTT, then have a quick look over this change. And if you use Open Weather Map, then make sure that you have set up your subscription correctly to cater for the API upgrade and to stay under the API limit. Well, that's most of it for this month. I'll leave a link to the beta release notes in the description. And thanks until next time.